chapter number 11, verse number 36. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not. And he, and, and he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a, with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause him to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. At, that at, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the, into the countries and shall overflow and pass over he shall enter also into the glorious land and, and, and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of, of um, Ammon he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and um, upon the countries in the land of the e in, a, in the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of the, um, over the treasures of gold and silver, and over all precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans, and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. When you're looking at this passage, it's it's clear there's going to be there. There's been no king up until this point that has done this. What is being said? How there are people who have come close to this. There are people in history who have come close to it. I think one of the most there's Antioch, Antioch of Epiphanes. There, you know, Epiphanes. He was like one of the main ones that it speaks about Antiochus the second. It also gives indication there's also this some of this even refers back to what Herod did how Herod worshiped he didn't worship the gods like his fathers did nor did he worship the God of Abraham you know the, the God that you know we serve he kind of blended everything together and made his own God and that's where we find Herod's temple right so there are instances where this made it look like this was talking about Herod or Antiochus but it has not been yet there's types and figures leading up to it and of course we're looking at this and this does spell out that of being the Antichrist. But as I'm reading it, and I'm reading through Daniel chapter 11, it's, it's historical. It's all history, going up to it, all what happened. And every time we talk about the kings of the north and the kings of the south, it's in relationship to the land, right? To the land of Israel. So it's, it's in relationships to, uh, to north and south. And every time it gives re reference to that, it's talking about the land and the battle of wars leading up until Roman Empire dominated. And up until then, I mean, you talk about Egypt and Ethiopia, it gives reference to Cleopatra in here. And this whole passage is like a beautiful masterpiece of prophecy. Could you imagine people who have trouble going back and studying history and going back and finding all the truths of this? I mean, you find all the battle plans, it's really cool. But when you get into this, when you get into this, it lumps past, but then it also blends in future. And this is, I think, what Daniel is like just trying to sit back and get his mind wrapped around it. I tried for 21 days without prayer and fasting. I can only imagine what happens with Daniel praying with fasting, how much he took getting out of this passage and getting this truth out. Remember, this this troubled him. In chapter 10, he's praying to figure it out. Chapter 11 and chapter 12, it's revealing and, and explaining to him what was going on. So in Daniel chapter 11, I want to point out some things about the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. Go to 1 John chapter number 4. And... Uh, We'll bounce around here in the Bible for a little bit this morning. First John chapter number four. And again, I'm doing this kind of not as clear as it was over the past week because of my notes left in the car. That was just embarrassing. That's not bad. Thursday, I was at work and I've got like you know I've got a this booth display and I had I've got a little mini, mini fridge here, full stock full of water, and I had put some water in the fridge and then I couldn't find my glasses when I left. All Thursday, I couldn't find my glasses. When I left, I couldn't find my glasses. All day Friday, I went without my glasses. I was gone from like 6 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. Couldn't drive without my glasses. Can't find them. 
I went in went in Saturday trying to find them milking high and low, and I finally gave up looking. I opened the refrigerator and got a bottle of water, and my glasses were on the bottom of the refrigerator, just sitting there. In the, I'm like, wow, that was pretty cool. But um, did you get that one, Ben? But I was like, oh. So, I but I found my glasses. So that's a good thing. But I mean, I literally had that kind of a week. <laughs> we literally had that kind of a week. I left my handgun at work. It's in the drawer. It's, it's somewhere where no one can really know where it's at. It's safe. But I left my handgun. I went and bought a new holster so I could conceal carry comfortably. And I left my gun at work. So I'm having all kinds of bad week. You know, I'm just letting you know. It happens with Alzheimer's or something. But in 1 John chapter 4, I think I just get some B12. If anybody's got some B12 on them, I'll take it. All right? I'll take some B12, put it through my system. 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Then he says this, and this is that spirit of what? Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should should come, and even now already is it in the world. So the spirit of Antichrist is in the world today. And there are false prophets out there, and they're going to go out there and deny Christ. There are false prophets out there that believe that Jesus did come in the flesh. But they reject the gospel. They're also Antichrist. Of course, we know that. But there's some things, and we'll go through five points, and I had eight. There's five points that I can remember from studying about the spirit of Antichrist. We're going to kind of go through this morning because I believe that it's possible that a believer unintentionally has a has a one of the points of the spirit of Antichrist within they, that they manifest. And the reason why is because the Antichrist is a man of sin, and Christians can have sin in their life, and they demonstrate the same things that. The Antichrist has. I'm not saying Christians are Antichrist. What I'm saying is he's a man of perdition. He's a man of sin. He's a man of sin being revealed, right? And we're going to have that same things in our life because if we're not in the if we're in the flesh, we're not minding the spiritual things, and we're going to manifest sin rather than spirit. All right. So there's got to be careful that because when we look at that, it's like, well, that's pretty bad. We look at the false prophets in the world. We look at preachers who turn bad or preachers who are wrong. And it glares out glowingly, especially when a preacher has got up there and preached truth for so long that he starts preaching something co contrary to that. You're like, whoa, something's messed up here. I remember Jack Hiles, preacher for years. The guy preached for decades, and he started preaching some stuff that was like, wait, what? Wait, what a second, what? Pastor Carter down, down at Landmark. He was not always this kind of way off the deep end right. preaching Kabbalah. He wasn't always that way. He used to be like solid and strong on things, and then he just started like, I don't know, he just started dabbling in some things and started messing up, and no one spoke up and no one spoke to him and said, hey, you're going down the wrong path. This is not a path to go down. And when a person comes up and says, hey, can we maybe like check yourself? You know, can you? And having that person lovingly to do that and loving you know, another preacher, another church member saying, Pastor, is this was this the direction we're going? If this is the direction we're going, I don't know if I want to be here or not. And it happened, that's a good, that's a hard conversation to have. Okay, I had the conversation with the owner of the flea market this past week, and I was like, "If this is the direction you're going, I don't want to be here." Just letting you know. If this is the attitude you're going to have leaving, I don't want to be here anymore. And the guy's like, "Oh no!" Just he started backpedaling. When he starts backpedaling, that's good because he's not quite defiant in it yet. Yeah. He's still kind of. You know, now he's embarrassed. But when a person gets up there finally, blah, 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 he's like, okay, yeah, 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 time to go. But there's, what I'm saying is there's people, there's believers that could have this. It could be me. It's probably you. It could be it could be one of us that has the spirit. We need to make sure we check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Number one is deception. He is a deceiver. He's a deceiver. In Second John chapter number one, Verse number 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an what? Antichrist. 
He's a deceiver. The Bible says that Satan walks about seeking whom he may devour, but he does things through deception. Remember Eve in the garden? Remember? He deceived her. He beguiled her. He was more subtle. He was more versed in what God said than what she was. And all she had to go by was what Adam had told her. Remember, we don't find where God told Eve. We find where God told Adam. Right? God told Adam. Adam tells Eve, and it's not at all what God told Adam. I'm going to trust what God says 100% of the time, right? I was talking to a guy this past week. And uh, let me think where I was at. Let me, let me run my mind where I was at. Oh, it was Wednesday night. That's when it was. Wednesday night. And the guy came to the church and he was all messed up. And he was like, well, he's telling me that God never repented. And I was like, well, the Bible says in Jonah chapter 3, we have to go back to the Hebrew and find the right word. I'm like, do you read Hebrew? He goes, no. I said, then what benefit is me going back to the Hebrew? He goes, well, I've got a strong concordance. I said, well, the strong concordance doesn't match with what the Bible says in context. He says, well, you've got to have as much faith in the strong as you do in the Bible. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. But he was like literally going down that path. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, God never repented. Well, God repented. Oh, well, I mean, well, I mean, repentance means a lot of different things. I'm like, you're right. It does. It has several different definitions. But never in God's word does it say repent of sins for salvation. It never does, right? It says believe. Only says believe. Have faith. Believe. Yeah, well, well, that's your interpretation. I'm like, the Bible says it. Play this day. But this guy was challenging me on it, but he was deceived. But the Bible says that in the latter, in the end times, in the latter days, right, the, the, when times get rough, in Second Corinthians, Second Timothy, and uh, three and Romans one, it says men will men will be deceived and well, de well, being deceived and deceiving, right? Deceiving and being deceived, it's going to happen more and more because the Antichrist is the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world today. The spirit of the Antichrist has been in every person, every king, every ruler, every age. The spirit of the Antichrist has been, it's always been in place of Christ. It's always been there. You also find in 1 Peter chapter 5 that he's a destroyer. He seeks to devour. He's a destroyer. Even in our text in, uh, in Daniel chapter number 11, he seeks to destroy. Let's go. Ahead, let's try it out in chapter number nine. That's where I'm going with it. Again, this is going without notes, so bear with me. Chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cease, he, goes, so he shall cause the sacrifice of the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of, abom of abominations he shall make it desolate, ruin it, destroy it, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Go back to chapter number 7. Here's another passage here in Daniel chapter 7 we've seen before. In verse number 25. And he shall speak great work, words against the Most High, and, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He's going to wear them out. And to think to, ch to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his, his dominion to consume it, to destroy it to the end. But he says that there's another passage over in, first, well, over in Revelation 13. Let um, me go there, but it kind of goes hand in hand with my another point, but we'll go to Revelation 13 real quick. And we'll go to this other point, and then we'll get to the, uh, of course, we know in, I'm going to read here in Revelation 12, verse number, verse number 8, uh, verse number 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now I heard a loud voice sing in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So he talks about, of course, we know what's going to take place there in heaven. But in chapter number 13, it talks about this, about the false prophet, the Antichrist coming out, the beast. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of 
blasphemy. So he's also a blasphemer. That was one of my notes. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power in his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, but his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered at, um, after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto, a be unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things in blasphemies, that's a false prophet, and a, the power is given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and, and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he says here that he was going through and he was like waging war. So he's not just waging war. He's not just a destroyer, but he's waging war against the saints. He's waging war against the believers. But he's speaking blasphemies. And we're going to get to the blasphemies in a minute here as well. But well, you see some things. He's a deceiver. He's a destroyer. He's proud. That's another one. He's proud. We find that in uh, Isaiah chapter 14. He's been powered by Satan. He gets this power and authority from Satan, right? We know that he's going to, in um, Isaiah chapter 14, the devil behind all this, he's going to set himself up be next, to, next to God. He's going to set himself up along with God. Let's turn there, but it's important to see this because this is why we got the title Antichrist or Antichrist, because it's there. Sometimes we call Anna, like another. Some people call him Antichrist. It's kind of a name that's given in the South, mostly, because they don't pronounce words. But in Isaiah chapter number 14, and verse number 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou that um, how, cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's speaking blasphemies against God, the tabernacle, and those in heaven. Right? Then he says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. He's trying to set his establishment on the holy mount. And in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He says those things. This is what I will be. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to be alongside the Most High. And he's proud. He's haughty. But you remember when I said that believers can have the same attitude within them? Do you remember 3 John with Diotrephes? Diotrephes would not receive those that, that, who, that came in. He, he would not receive them into the church. And John said he prayed it against them with malicious words. The Bible says he spoke against them. And 3 John, some of the very things that the Antichrist does is he wages war with the saints. He's proud. He's a deceiver. He's a destroyer. And if you have a Diotrephes, that's what they do. A Diotrephes destroys. A Diotrephes deceives. A Diotrephes wages war against saints. Uh, he sets himself up as being equal with God or in a place of God, having his reputation above anyone else. You remember not too long ago, a couple years ago, we were at a church service that turned into a business meeting, and the man got up there and openly said that his, his notes were just as good as Scripture. Remember that? A Diotrephes is someone who has who is acting in the same fashion with the spirit of Antichrist that the Antichrist has. The same spirit, the same the same technicalities. And there's many types of the Antichrist in the world today. We look at Hitler, right? As far as being an evil man, that man was evil. Mussolini, a wicked evil man. Uh, we look at the William, okay, we look at Donald Trump. He's got some of the same factions. Proud, he's a deceiver. He's There's a lot of things towards that. Uh, Obama, every person that's ever walked to the face of the earth, you can see spirits of Antichrist in them because people operate in the flesh and in sin rather than in the spirit. Okay? I can, let's go through some preachers. Better not. All right, let's look at some preachers that can have that same attitude of operating in the flesh. There's been times in my, there's been times that I have operated in the flesh. There's been times where I've been proud. There's been times where I've been deceived and I've deceived people by being deceived. There's been times that I've destroyed good things. It's not because I it's not because I did it willfully. I did it in ignorance. And Paul says, "Hey, I persecuted the church, but I did it in ignorance. I just was deceived, and yet I deceived others." He says, "But I did it in ignorance. I was proud. I waged war against the saints." If you could look at anybody in the New Testament and say, "Wow, this guy was an antichrist. This guy was an antichrist," it was Paul. Sorry, it was Saul. 
And then he got saved. So I'm not saying that a per that ever Christian is the Antichrist. I'm saying that it's the spirit of Antichrist could be within there. Just like there's a... By the way, if you ever study out Jezebel, and you look at the characteristics of Jezebel, and you look at the characteristics of the Antichrist, the spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of Antichrist are one and the same. They're one and the same. So look how much the spirit of Jezebel is in the world today. A lot of times Pentecostals like to run with that. you got the spirit of Jezebel in you. The bachelor's like, you got the Antichrist all over you. So it's like they're saying the same thing, basically, towards the same focus on there. But they like to mismanage. They like to overthrow... Um, they like to overthrow authority. They like to go circumvent authority. They have to be the, the high ones. They have to, if anybody along is along the way that has a little bit more clout than them, they have to take it down. They'll take stands on the most outrageous things. They got They've got to be the supreme leader. The spirit of Jezebel does that, and it's, they kind of they, they share a lot of the same characteristics. If you would go to Second Corinthians chapter number eleven. This is what I'm going to spend some time on. This is Antichrist. He is Antichrist. Now, that's that's what he is. That's the spirit he carries. But he's also Antichrist. And I found this passage this past week, and I was like, that's an interesting place to put it, because I've never really seen it there before. Right in the Bible. Imagine that. But it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, now when we think of Antichrist, we're thinking of against Christ, like in opposition to Christ, right? But we also know this, he's going to be in opposition to Christ because he's against Christ. We know that, right? He's got the spirit of Satan in him, he's, he's got Satan's powers, he's against God, he's against Christ. The Bible says he speaks against God, he gets, speaks against the tabernacle, he speaks against those in heaven, and he wages war against the saints, right? So we know those are three, four main things that he does but we also find something about this is that he also presents himself as being another Christ. Another of this another of a different one, you know, another of a different kind, a para alongside of. So Muslims believe that Jesus stole the glory that was supposed to go to Muhammad. They claim Muhammad is another Christ. Christ is an office. He's a title. He's a position. And they have another Christ. Jovis, Jovis, or no, Mormons. No. Yeah, Mormons. They believe in another Christ. They have another persuasion, another bit towards it. There are denominations out there, or there's people that they have another in place of. They have another person in place of. Or alongside of. So they have a para. It's alongside of. Well, the problem with that is, this is what the Antichrist kind of comes in with. Yes, he's in opposition to Christ, but he comes and makes his mark as being alongside Christ. He comes in making it sound like he is the answer to this. He's bringing on, He comes across with religion and with Christianese. He speaks Christianese, right? He doesn't speak Chinese. He speaks Christianese. But in Second uh, Corinthians chapter number 11... Would to God he would bear me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest any mean, by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus... Whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might be you might uh, well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. He's saying, I have I if there's someone comes along and preaches another Christ, another gospel, gives you another spirit, a para spirit. It's not in place of Christ, it's another spirit. Christ. It's a different version of Christ. It's another spirit that you haven't already received. It's another gospel. It's another truth. It's something that has never been recorded anywhere else. And he's coming with this newfangled doctrine, this newfangled slant. It's a spirit of Antichrist, and he's trying to come alongside and take what is only belonging to Christ. It's para. P-A-R-I, right? It's a, it's a para. It's, it's alongside of. And it's trying to come along with being in place of. But we find he's trying to come alongside and he's coming against Christ. He preaches another gospel. 
he, for, he comes in, there's another gospel, and he just destroys the true gospel that Christ has not come in flesh. He destroys the, the gospel that it's not by grace through faith, it's by your works. He comes with another gospel saying that you have to do X, Y, and Z in order to get there. He brings another spirit that is not than what the Holy Spirit gives you. And he pours the stuff on. It makes it seem like you're lacking. And the whole world is looking at it. The whole world will accept it because it fancies the world and it takes godliness and mirrors it together just like Herod did. Herod, they didn't worship how the, how, how the Jews worship. They didn't how, how God's people worship with the sacrificing and all that. They did their own ideas. And that's why you find Herod's temple. They were selling and making merchandise and doing half sacrifices and half oblations, half true sincerity, and they were just kind of mirroring with it. And he was just kind of, hey, this is how the temple, this is how the, the temple, this is what Herod did for us. He built temples. Look what he did. He built this temple for us to worship him. But it was mirroring half of this and half of that and making a hybrid religion. You know, you don't find the Pharisees anywhere in the Old Testament. You don't find their position anywhere in the Old Testament. It wasn't until the Roman Empire, before they came alongside, when the Maccabees held off the enemy for so long, and then they reached out and asked for help. When the Maccabees reached out and asked for help, that's where the Pharisees, that's what that's where you find out like the Pharisees started stepping in. They were trying to get it in the between. And I don't read the Apocrypha for that. You look through history and find that. They held off for so long, but then they asked for help. Anytime you go down to the world for help, anytime you trust the world for help, anytime you go to the world to try getting understanding, it breeds contempt, it breeds doctrinal error, it breeds misunderstanding. Why should Christians go to the world for understanding of God's word? Why should the Christians go for to the world for permission to do what we want? I am all for it. Look, I understand people want to have a sign of a petition like in New Jersey they're trying to sign a petition in Pennsylvania signing a petition so they could go back to church newsflash for you we already had permission to have church when the country was founded it's called the Constitution and they cannot make any laws prohibiting religion and the exercise that all we already had permission and yet we went to the police we went there and asked permission all these churches out here in this area that have shut down their churches and they're still trying to get struggling back on their feet because they all complied with the government not to have church. And you say it's just a small matter, not a big deal. It's a big matter. Community Baptist Temple still has yet to do Sunday night churches. Some of these churches around the area are still getting back so they're not even having Sunday night church because the numbers were down to begin with and now they're just trying to consider only having Sunday morning. And they allowed a pandemic, something the government created, to shut them down. I'm not going to go to the law. I'm not going to go to the to the officials, the public officials, to ask permission to obey God. It's been it was a smokescreen. It was a it was a Trojan horse, and the government put it in place because if there's only one thing we're going to fear, it's our own personal safety, our own personal health. We'll trust God with everything else but our own personal health. I mean, good golly, Miss Molly, we brought in Obama for the purpose of Obamacare. And I'm not getting political. I'm just telling you, hey, by the way, there's nothing wrong with getting political. But getting the, the, the smoking gun, this, this, this Trojan horse that got it put on us three or four months ago in churches all around this area, all around Ohio, all around Summit County, all around uh, up in Cleveland, whatever county that is, all around the area, people are tripped up and are trying to get back on their feet, and they forfeited something, and they can't get it back. And they're fighting like tooth and nail to get it back. And the people are scared stiff. We can go to the grocery store, Pastor, but Sunday night church, I just don't know. And the, the Antichrist is going to come alongside with some, false, with some false ideas and trying to mirror things together. I'm never going to ask permission from the government to have church. I'm never going to do it. Well, are you your 501c3? No, we're not. We're registered as a nonprofit. I don't need a 501c3. We don't need a 501c3 status to have church. Is it evil to have a 513c status? No, it's not. But when they they said, well, you have to register, you have to ask permission from the state to be a church. I said, no. I sent a letter to the state saying we are a church. Recognize it or not. With so many, you know, nice way to put it. But I was like, we are a church, and you you must recognize us as a church. And that's you know it's ridiculous that these people are these people are are 
asking permission from the government and seeking permission and you know, complying with the government on everything in their own personal world and now is bringing it to the church and is just making people falter, making people fail. It's 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 wicked. It's sad. And it's the it's spirit of Antichrist that wages war. We are in a sophisticated war. Never have I seen this Never have we seen anything as sophisticated against our rights, against our privileges, without firing missiles and any before. I mean, this puts the Cold War like baby right. stuff. And it's to our own people. But it's not just because we're Americans. It's because it's the freedoms of men being taken away. It's the spirit of Antichrist and deception. Look at... Um, Look at Matthew 24. He comes to long place. He's a deceiver. He's, he's anti-Christ. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So if any man comes and say to you, Lo, here is a Christ or there, believe it not. But if it was possible, they should deceive the very elect, the very believers. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they, they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Good news is this. We don't have to go to Christ first to be raptured. He's coming for us. He's coming to resurrect us. He's coming to, to reclaim us. He's coming to get us. We don't have to go find him. Aren't you glad for that? I don't have to go looking for him. I don't have to go look where he's at to go find him. He's already come and he's coming back for me. And it says in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. So it's like it says this is going to take place. The Antichrist is going to be the world and immediately after the tribulation. Well, I believe the Antichrist come after the tribulation. Have you read the Bible ever in context? Well, it's in Matthew 24. Okay, well then read Matthew 24 in context of everything we're reading through Daniel. Someone was like, well, you believe in the pre-trib rapture. You don't understand the Old Testament. I'm like, wow. So, I don't understand the Old Testament. And that's why I find everything laying out for us as far as this Antichrist and then the gathering. Antichrist and the gathering. Antichrist and the gathering. But the New Testament in three verses is a gathering in the Antichrist. If that's true, then why are you worrying about the Antichrist? If I'm not here for the Antichrist, why are you spending so much time trying to identify him that Obama was the Antichrist or that Clinton was the Antichrist? Anyone but a Republican is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is it always going that... Why is it everybody that disagrees with you is the Antichrist? But if we're not here for it, why should we care? Because we know deep down in our hearts we are. I've seen so many people who are adamant pre-tribbers looking at this thing down the barrel, just a little bit of tribulation, just a sliver of tribulation, just a slight bit of, not even nothing major yet, and they're flipping out. Well, maybe it is after the tribulation. I mean, we're spared from God's wrath, but what if there's man's wrath and then God's wrath is separate? <laughs> Dude, totally like, if you could do that and you put it in where would you think that might be? Like middle of the week. Awesome. Now let's give <laughs> definitions to the two parts. <laughs> Pre-wrath, post-wrath. Yeah, yeah. Pre-wrath of God. Yeah, yeah. And the rapture takes place at that point. Yeah. Awesome. Can I show you the Bible where it spells it up for you? Yeah. Well, that's not my. That's not. That's not directed to me. That's not in context. You know, it's <laughs> not my dispensation. I'm like you just came so close. <laughs> so close. Matthew chapter, no, look at Mark chapter 13. I think it's Mark, I don't know, I didn't write it down. Got so many pastors who are afraid. Oh, was it Mark? Ah! Oh. Maybe I'm in Matthew. Hang on a second, let me, let me look at some other places here. We have so many people who are digging their head in the hand. They don't know what to do. Pastors have lost hope. They're scared to death. They don't know what to do. Might be Luke. He's like scared to death. They don't know what they're going to do. 
All right, well, I don't know where the passage was, but it's chapter 13, verse 32. You can find it. <laughs> this is my notes back in the car, so it's okay. They don't know what to do. The pastors are just in awe. They're distraught. They're losing faith. They're questioning anything from the Bible at all because we're going through a little bit of persecution, a little bit of tribulation in America. Land of three, home of God, God's nation. And they're having all just distraught because they never thought in a million years that God would judge or that God would allow mishap to happen to America. Well, have they not studied American history ever? I mean, forget the Old Testament history for a second. Have you ever studied American history? God's punished America several times. Things have come into America all the time. Where have you been? Hiding under a rock? Well, you thought Donald Trump was going to be the great save-all? Yeah, you're going to be right on task for being the one who's going to take on the mark of the beast. You're right on task for running, being deceived by the Antichrist. And I wonder, well, Christians can't get deceived, but I'm thinking they may not be Christians. But he comes alongside Antichrist, being against Christ, being in place of Christ. Well, you think of Galatians chapter 1, we can go there real quick. Galatians chapter 1, going back to the part about the gospel. If anybody preaches another gospel than that which you receive, he's supposed to be accursed. You're not supposed to look for the good in things. Well, you know, I think he's a good guy. I think he's a little bit wrong in this area. No, if they preach any other gospel than that which you receive, he's supposed to be marked and avoided. A curse counted as nothing worthy of them. Well, I mean, sure, they're kind of wrong about salvation, but, you know, if you're, pedal if you're a believer and you peddle a wrong gospel, I don't want any part of you. That's what the Bible tells us. Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 6. I am marvel that you are so so removed from him that called you into his grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, it's not of a different kind, it's not of a, it's not another of the same kind, right? But it's a different, if it's, it's to another gospel, verse number 6 is another as being completely different, another, verse number 7, as of the same kind, right? That's two different definitions, para or against, okay? But there be some that, that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed as we said before so say and I again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received let him be accursed it says the same things but we just read in 2 Corinthians 11 if they bring any other gospel any other spirit any other Christ they're cursed they're false they're, they're wrong they're preaching the wrong doctrine Go to Revelation chapter 13. We kind of hit on this already. Well, this is all part of the waging war, so I've already hit on it, so I'll stop there. But um, you go through and you find this Antichrist and what he's going through. Yes, there have been people in history that match up with some things of Daniel chapter 11. There are some people in history that have matched up Daniel chapter 11. There's people, you know, like, like, like I said, like Herod. He matched up with it. Hey, his desire is going to be against, you know, he's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be all kinds of uh, wailing and persecution and craziness. I mean, Herod was one of the first postpartum abortionists there were. There's Pharaoh, there's Herod, there's legislators today. I mean, killing off two-year-olds, right? Killing off two-year-olds. Well, why? Because he was a threat to his kingdom. He had to set himself up. But wages, you know, so you see again, quickly re recapping here, half notes. He deceives, he's a destroyer, he's proud, he's haughty, lifted up. He's anti-Christ, both in opposition to, but also alongside to overthrow, okay, in place of. Satan knows he can't overthrow God. He knows he can't overthrow God, but he still wages war against the saints. Satan knows he can't overthrow God, but he still wants to set himself up as being next to God, as being alongside God. He knows he can't overthrow him. Antichrist is the same way. We find that going through, he wages war against God and against God and his saints. But he does, and he's gonna, he's gonna, and by the way, he's gonna do some damage. He's gonna prevail. The Antichrist is gonna make some waves. He's gonna kill some people. He's gonna make martyrs. But I love it. In the end, God's still gonna get. God's gonna get the victory. And I love that in Daniel chapter 11, when you read it through, it talks about those being doing exploits. And doing those things that are above and beyond, still witnessing, still winning souls, still doing the things that God wants us to do, 
and doing great things for the cause of Christ, even in persecution. Even when the Antichrist is the rise, we still find those people doing great exploits. And we can find hope in that and encouragement to keep on doing what we're doing in serving God. Even when the world wants to squeal on us and turn us in, you know what? We're still going to serve God. Even though family don't understand us and wants to put us under and calls us radicals and calls us nutcases, you know what? We're still going to serve God. Even if the government is forcing us, is trying to force us and do things and trying to track us and mask and, and next year it's going to be vaccinations and inoculations and, and they're trying to do everything all these things to us we already know the worst the world's going to try doing we can stand fast we can stay strong not because we're anarchists but because we serve christ right we're not trying to have the rule of the people we're trying to serve god and no matter what we're no matter what we face we can still do exploits and even great exploits as we serve god as we seek him first we find god's spirit being poured upon even in even the midst of tribulation god's spirit is poured upon the sons and daughters and they prophesy they preach they set forth the word of god they make the word of god clear and plain they're still preaching and serving god even with all this going on we don't go hide in a cave somewhere we're not hiding in a you know we're not hiding in in the groves we're not they're out there making half fish in the supermarket and trying to find half christian you know trying to find christians we're not living in in the shadows we're out there serving god and we're going to do great we're going to do exploits even great things for the cause of christ greater things than what christ has done because he's in us so don't give up don't get don't get don't get discouraged by it but there is a spirit of antichrist in the world just make make sure ourselves we're not demonstrating that let's make let's make sure that we're we're showing forth the, the spirit of the lord and not the spirit of antichrist let's make sure that's what we have to do in our own hearts and minds and lives all anyway, right let's go ahead and pray and ask god's blessing on our next service and our time of fellowship and uh mateo if you would lead us in prayer